Hello everybody, welcome to Your Vet Online and today little Mordecai is helping me. We're going to be talking all about dog nu and cat nutrition and I know it's one of those topics. Hello everybody, welcome to Whoops, what's going on Online. here? I think we've got a playback there. <laughs> So that's a bit of a laugh. Yeah, so basically today we're going to be talking all about diets and how you can choose a great diet for your animal. And um, so we're talking about nutrition and all that sort of thing. Now, it is a huge, huge topic and <laughs> there's a lot to go through. So I, I want you to ask any questions you have, make sure you pop them in the, um, you know, the links below, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on um, Facebook, please just do that because that will um, basically will help me know what you guys want to hear about. So let's get right to it. Why is pet food such a big topic? It is huge, isn't it? It's one of those things I see asked about in every single animal Facebook page, basically, or group. Everyone's always wondering, what do I feed my puppy? What do I feed my um, dog? My cat's got this problem, or my puppy refuses to eat this food, or the breeder says this, or my vet says that. And it's, there's just so many things to think about. And sadly, one of the worst things about pet diets is that it's an extremely unregulated industry so there's a lot of marketing that goes on and that doesn't necessarily mean that what you're getting is what you think you're getting and what you're being told is a good food maybe not quite so good or what we think it might be you know we've got um Lots of questions, you know, should we be feeding organic, natural, raw, kibble, you know, and supplements? What about safety? What about, as I just said, like the marketing that goes through it? And so I'm going to use the time today to talk about all those things and how you can choose a great diet for your animals. Right. Now, if you haven't met me before. I'm Dr. Lee Davidson from Your Vet Online and I've been practicing now for over 20 years and basically I started Your Vet Online to help you guys. So animal owners everywhere. We're a group of veterinarians who basically provide consultations via telemedicine so it's all online we're available 24-7, so it doesn't matter what time you have an issue, our vets are always online to help you, and we can do that really easily. So um, our consults are $49.95, and as I said, available 24-7. Righty-ho, now let's get right to it. How do we actually select a diet and that is a really it's it's more complicated than many people think in the sense of you've got to evaluate not only your animal and so you've got to decide what their needs are but you've also got to take a look at what your needs are so as the person who's actually providing that food because some of it is you know, there, there are so many things to think about, and we'll go over that shortly. You've also got, well, this is what happens when I look at a diet, when someone comes to me, I've got to assess the current diet and see whether that matches up with the claims it makes, as well as the, whether it fits your particular pet, and also whether um, it actually stacks up with what it says on the label. So that can be a big question two. So let me start with a little bit of something about what's actually important to you. Because a lot of this, we we do like to think about feeding our animals and 
how it's important to us. So that might have to mean that we feed a certain way because of our religion, because of our cultural beliefs, because maybe we um, have firm beliefs in environmental sustainability. Perhaps we actually really are interested in preserving animal welfare. And there's some things that we'd prefer not to do because of that. Most importantly as well, we've also got to consider the cost of the type of diet that we want to feed, how convenient that is to us. So if we're a person who is super busy, you know, we've got a high pressure job that will maybe it's got very, very long hours, you know, um, you don't, you maybe don't want to be choosing a diet that's going to take a long time for you to prepare and take that time away from other things that you could have been doing, like, you know, maybe taking the kids to sport. You know, if you've got a choice, do you make food for your dog or do you take, you know, spend some time with your children? And I know that can be a really tough decision to make for many people, but it's one that you have to consider. Cost is huge too, because some of these diets are extremely expensive. And do they actually provide the nutrients that are actually re required for our pets or again, is it just marketing? So we also, the other thing we need to remember is even do we have access to some of these things? So let's use, say, home cooked or raw diets as an example. You know, you might need a quite a large storage facility, you know, a freezer to store that meat so that it doesn't go off very quickly. You know, you don't want to have to be buying fresh food every single day for your pet. Hey, some of you might, but that's something to consider. So always think about, you know, do you, can you afford to feed the food that you're choosing? Do you have the storage capacity for some of that food? Um, is it easy to access? You know, um, are the ingredients you're buying always of a certain quality? You know, you've got to make sure that that's, um, that's all covered. Now, let me see. Let's just speak about your animal just quickly. So, and, and we need to just point this out. When we talk about feeding a diet for your pet, we talk about nutrients. And we don't really, well, while um, ingredients are important, we've got to remember that it's sort of like the um, the nutrients are the building blocks of what we need to eat. And they are going to be what makes our animal healthy. And they are the ones that need to be in the right um, amounts and of a good quality. So when we start looking at our own animal, we've got to look at things and go, okay, well, let's think about species, for example. Cats are not small dogs, and dogs are not small humans. They all rely on different nutrients to get, to make sure that they are healthy and living that long and healthy, prosperous life. Now, we also need to know that cats, for example, are obligate carnivores. So that means they must have prey in their diet. And we don't, we say prey because meat is just not enough. Flicking your cat a bit of chicken is not a balanced and appropriate diet for your cat. And believe me, I know a lot of people who just feed, want to feed their cats chicken and they give little of anything else. So it's really, really important that we think about that. We also need to think about this life stage of our animal, um, whether it's a, you know, a puppy or a kitten, or whether it's a... Um, large breed dog, for example. So large breed dogs require, well, and puppies and kittens, they re, um, definitely require a lot more calories, and so that's energy, but they also need to have certain very specific guidelines and very specific requirements for certain ingredients, such as calcium and phosphorus, and we may need to make sure that that's really highly tuned. Like if we get those ratios wrong, then we can really stuff up that animal's growth. And if we talk about large breed dogs, for example, 
large breed dogs have an extra component because you know we they go through that gangly stage and they look all terrible and we have people saying oh he's too thin and you need to feed more but really we want them to grow to their potential but we don't want them to overgrow because that's when we if we push it along too much that's when we start having all those problems with musculoskeletal issues like OCD and you know all those sort of osteo um problems and that sort of stuff so you've got to be really careful especially with your those breeds those large breed dogs now what else have I got here yes so let's also consider when we're talking about puppies and kittens because I know from the consults that I get a lot of people are just like oh how do I decide and we've also got to remember that with our very young also our very old um, with the very young, they have a very naive immune system. The very old, it might be compromised and just a little bit more. That's the dog. That's not me. Um, if you heard that, a big snore. Um, they have a very, comp um, sometimes their immune system is compromised. So we've also got to think about that and how a particular diet. Um, so if we think of things like raw diets, they have a very high bacterial load just naturally. So if we've got a young animal, we've got to be very careful that we're not, or an old animal, we're not putting them at risk of getting infections because of, because of that. Right. What else have we got here? Okay. So then we have to start thinking about how to actually select a food. And often, I've just got a little picture here. Often you'll hear people talk about and vets probably talk about the Wasava guidelines for selecting pet foods. And I'll try and put a link to that. Have I got that up? No. Um, I'll put a link to that below when um, I'm finished here and you can go and take a look at it. But essentially what this is, it explains how you can assess a dog food that you um, by like a commercial dog food. So whether it's a kibble or whether it's a um, raw diet, that's a commercial raw diet, the same um, you know things count. So you're looking at things like, is it AFCO um, certified? Now, AFCO has guidelines. They are a minimum guideline. They don't talk about maximums. They talk about minimums. And basically, it means that a, that a food has gone through some sort of regulation, in a sense. So we know that it meets certain requirements. Um, we also want to make sure it's complete and balanced. We want to make sure that um, we have, uh, let me see, we, we actually know who the manufacturer is and there's all these questions so do they have a registered nutritionist or veterinary nutritionist on their team or do they just have someone formulating this product um, just once and they don't actually work in that business that's a really big question because if you start having problems with your animal when it's been eating that food, you want to be able to ring that company and you want to be able to talk to their nutritionist or their veterinarian and go through what's going on with your animal and what's happening with that diet. Because if you can't do that, it's a really high probability that that company is just a marketing face for a brand that's not, um, they're not actually making that for a well they just they're just they're not what you'd call a food company they're a, a marketing company making food if you know what I mean then you also want to make sure that the company what and ask them what their processes are for auditing and um, ensuring that that diet is actually what they say it is again it can be a bit tricky um, a lot of these um, companies, don't do quality assurance we don't know whether the amount whether the diet with the 
The ingredients are all sourced and tested before they go into the diet. Are they tested after the diet being formulated? And that's why sometimes we have these issues with these recalls because we find out there might be contaminants in, in the diet or, um, you know, something's not quite right. A lot of these, um, the better diets as well, they actually conduct feeding trials. And feeding trials are conducted over something like 26 weeks and they test to see how an animal copes over time and whether there's any changes that pop up during that time. One thing to note is that not there's actually no, none of these trials actually look at senior animals. So it's a little bit iffy on that part of things. So when a diet starts talking about senior animals, we've just got to be a little bit careful because depending on who the company is, there might not actually be that many diets that actually are appropriate. Well, not saying they're not appropriate, but they might not be actually doing the feeding trials. If we look at pet food labels, then, okay, let's... So with a pet food label, we've got to remember that it's an ingredient list. It's not, um, it's not talking about nutrients. And I sort of say this, I might just show this little thing. Yeah. So it's all about the ingredients in the diet. And that doesn't actually tell us much more than it's just ingredients. And again, there's been a lot of hoo-ha and a lot of marketing to say that, you know, you should you should ensure that X, Y, Z, you know, a meat protein is really high on that list of ingredients. And that doesn't necessarily mean anything other than that maybe that the weight is higher. So for some, for example, for some diets, what some companies have actually done is instead of um, weighing the product say raw before they put it in they dry it down they get rid of all the water in it and then they say and they add more in so that it just goes up a little bit or they you know the weight of it is higher for that you know um well sorry it's the other way around with more water in the in that meat it's going to be heavier so it depends, again, on how the company is measuring those weights. And again, it, as I just say, like with this uh, slide that I've got here, it's not so much about the ingredient, it's more about what the nutrients are. And we've got to remember that meat doesn't necessarily, it's just a source of protein, for example. And it's got other things in there too. Of course, it's got fats and oils and all those sorts of things and vitamins and minerals. But if we just take, say, the amino acid component, which is the protein component, what we can see here is that very clearly that you've got three different types of protein source there. And we can see how some are lacking in some things and some are high in other things. So if we were to actually make a formulation that is based on just one of those ingredients, it's likely we're going to be lacking in another. So that's why when we look at an ingredient list, it's not just because it might have corn in it or it might have soybean in it. It doesn't mean that it's, at, it's there because a company has been cheap. What they're doing is formulating a diet that is complete and balanced, and they're using the nutrients and those components to flesh out the things that maybe the protein source from a meat, such as chicken meat, is actually missing. So don't think that you must always have chicken or beef or pork or any of those meat proteins right at the very top. It doesn't necessarily mean that if they're further down, that it's a bad thing. And I think that's a fallacy that's been going on for far too long. And, and it doesn't help anyone, really. And that sort of brings us to the old 
pet food trends. And I guess, yeah, there's, these have always been a little bit related to what's happening in humans at the, at the time. So we see, for, for some reason, some people think, oh, you know, carbs are bad. They think that a carb means sugar. That's not necessarily true. There's different types of carbs out there. So we've got structural carbohydrates, which is more like our fibers and that sort of thing, which is extremely important um, for our animals. Like, you going to come in here? Let's see if he, <laughs> he wants to come and have a cuddle. Say hello, everyone. What do you guys say hello? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a lot of talk by some people out there that if you're feeding a diet that's got carbohydrates in it, it's just like feeding your dog or cat sugar or processed food. Um, and that like that is bad for humans. So human processed food, cat and dog processed food is definitely not the same, is it? No, we don't feed our dogs lollies and things like that. And the equivalent, you know, like kibble and that sort of thing is not the equivalent. It's if you hear people talking that in that way, I would argue that you should actually probably just switch it off straight away and just say, look, you guys, uh, you've got your, you've got yourselves all mixed up and you're not the nutritionist that you're stating you are because it's actually nutrition 101. <laughs> so it's kind of bad when you hear that. So we, yeah, so there's all those diets. So grain-free is another one that people are trying to feed their animals. And if you've heard me talk before, grain-free is not recommended at the moment. We're still working out what the problem is. It's, there are issues with um, amino acids. There's issues with the B vitamins. We still don't know exactly what the cause is, but whatever it is, it's how it's formulated. So at this point in time, there's certain things like peas and um, other legumes that we that are high in these diets. They're obviously causing reactions in some way. Um, and we're seeing dogs um, on these diets that are, that are actually um, suffering from dilated cardiomyopathy interestingly we're also seeing a little bit of that in some of these raw diets and i think that might be because um some of these commercial raw diets because they must be putting some of these vegetables into those diets as well so it's it's an interesting topic i have spoken about it before the data is changing all the time and all i can say is that there are very 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 few like minuscule numbers of, of um, animals that are actually gluten intolerant and who must have a grain-free diet. I will make a video a bit later on how to um, work out how to, you know, if, you're, if you've got a dog or a cat that's really, really itchy or has really, really stinky farts and diarrhea and all that sort of stuff. And if you want to try and do an elimination diet, I'll have a bit of a chat, I think. I'll do another video on that because it's a really interesting topic. A lot of people get it wrong. It's not just about changing from a kibble to a raw diet. It's not about changing a brand. It's all about protein and what's actually in that ingredient list. So, um yeah, I'll do another video on that because it's really important, I think, that we we get that right because I see so many people wasting so much money, wasting so much time, and their poor animals are suffering while they're doing that. So, yes. So the other things that we often see on labels are things like a natural diet. Natural, again, has is a word that actually has particular meaning, especially in the US. So it the diet must um, must actually satisfy certain requirements. Exactly the same with organic, and that's everywhere. Um, they must satisfy certain requirements. 
um, organic, they're quite tough. So if an animal, um, if there's a diet or anything that says organic, absolutely everything in that chain of events to make that product must come from an organic certified um, production line, whether it's um, the grain, whether it's the meat and or whatever, the supplements. And it can be really, really hard to formulate a diet because remember a lot of the vitamins and minerals are actually um, synthetic in nature. So <laughs> it can be really, really tough to get an organic um, diet. Um, and then the other one, of course, is the whole uh, human grade thing. So human grade, what that just means is that the whole process from farm to plate occurs in um, in a, in a uh, way that means that a human can potentially um, consume that product because it's been um, processed in a way that it hasn't been mixed up with other things. So, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's bad. And, in a, and particularly in Australia and New Zealand, there are no sort of pet food companies and manufacturing plants that sort of do things in a way that are bad anyway. So um, a lot of that yeah, I, I would argue it's a little bit of a marketing ploy again. Let's just talk here a little bit about raw diets. He's just still having cuddles. Um, <laughs> he's having a good cuddle here. Mr. Mordecai is on a little bit of a... Um, He's my neighbor's dog and he gets a mix of a raw commercial raw diet and a kibble. Um, and there's certain things about a raw diet that we really need to touch on. A raw diet is a strategy. It's not, it's not what we'd call a specific product. All it means is that it's just uncooked. So um, <laughs> He's chewing my finger. Um, yeah, so it's just uncooked. You've got to be a bit careful because sometimes some of these commercial things, they actually freeze dry and they have all those sorts of ingredients in there as well. So it's not always completely true as such. It depends on how black and white you want to be. Um, there's a huge emo amount of emotional attachment related to raw diets and I always tend to say it's a little bit like a movement you know um yeah and people become quite diehard they become quite intent on making you switch over to a raw diet because they say it's so much better or it's got all these benefits and things and I'll go into the pros and cons of it of them shortly but in saying that, we've, you know, and we go back to what we're capable of doing as an owner, it might be that you just don't have time for that. And so you need to have a commercial raw diet and that's fine. But just remember, you need to look at these guidelines and make sure that the commercial product actually meets those as well because it's applicable to both kibble diets and your um, raw diets, if that's what you're um, decided to feed. The, um, I guess the, the thing that we've got to say as well, a lot of people will argue that raw diets, you know, animals live a lot longer, they're healthier, um, their, yeah, their longevity is better. There's been a, a few studies on this and there's no evidence to suggest that it's any different like there's or there's any benefit sorry we actually um yeah we know where there's plenty of evidence for certain kibbles that show that it can increase um health um particularly if we look at well absolutely if we're talking about the specific um prescription diets they're definitely very, very good. And we know because there's been evidence, otherwise they wouldn't be able to get that claim that they actually do what they're supposed to do. And, um, you know, they're really, really good. 
I guess the um, thing is, is that, yeah, we haven't seen those same sorts of that same sort of research being performed with these raw diets, even with the companies that are commercial making these, you know, diets, commercial diets. Um, are they even performing feeding trials? None of them seem to write anything about that, um, which makes it a little bit concerning. Um, so, you know, we've just got a, it's, it's a question mark. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's a question mark. We've also got to look at the risk of nutritional adequacies. So a lot of the raw diets, um, and we're not so much talking commercial here, when we're more talking the, the at-home um, prepared diets. A lot of people, um, you know, are using some random recipe, you know, the 80-20, oh, what is it, the 80-10-10 or the 85-10-5-5 rule. And I guess the thing is, when we're looking at diets and we're feeding these over time, then we we really need to understand that the ingredients that we're giving are at a standard that's not going to have fluctuations like this. You know, we're not going to go up and down. So um, over time, so it might change during a week. And maybe, it, you know, it might be high for one week, low for another week. But that's okay because it sort of evens out. But when we're, but it's extremely hard to understand that. And it's extremely hard to know what's going on with that. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we start doing these home cooked meals because it's exactly the same situation. So we've just got to be a bit careful about that. We also need to understand that raw diets are extremely high naturally in bacteria and everyone always uses the argument that dogs eat stuff off the ground dogs eat shit dogs eat whatever you know yeah they do and they sometimes get sick just like the raw diet that you're feeding them sometimes makes them sick um so it's you know chicken is extremely high um has ex an extremely high bacterial load and so we know that, you know, we would never attempt to feed chicken to ourselves raw, but we seem to think that our dog should be able to cope with that. Now, that's why one of the reasons why vets will often say, you know, avoid raw in the very young and the very old, because those are the animals that have the most um, naive or susceptible immune systems so we don't want to stress them any more than what we already are you know we, we don't want to pose an extra risk to them so i would always say avoid raw in those situations again when we're talking about raw and feeding large breed puppies it's just a no-go just don't even go there it's way too hard to get the nutrient balance correct to ensure that those large breed dogs or, you know, I'm even talking from any dog, you know, Labrador up, size up, um, just avoid raw as a puppy. Feed them a commercial kibble until they've reached skeletal maturity. And for most of those dogs, you're looking at about 18 months plus. So you want to be smart about things. I'm not saying I'm not condemning raw forever. I'm just weighing up the balance of risk versus benefit. And for puppies and for large breed dogs and for old dogs, raw has actually got a lot of negatives about it. The other thing, I guess, is that we've got to consider our own and public health and immunity status. Because we know, because studies have shown, that when a dog is fed raw, then they have a higher bacterial load within themselves that may not necessarily result in an infection for themselves, but it means that when they lick us or when they poop, there's higher load of bacteria in their body fluids and in their poop. So if you've got people in your presence and in your life or you're, you've got a dog that's been used as a guide dog or it's in a um you know a, a 
a dog that helps you, you know, a service dog or something like that, there's actually rules around not feeding them raw. And that's because they can put other people at risk just by their poop in their in their saliva and that sort of stuff. And we don't want to put, you know, imagine having a family member who's got cancer, their immune system is depressed because they're on chemotherapy and they're cleaning up your dog's poop and, you know, they get a couple of kisses a day and, you know, they get very, very ill because from something like salmonella or campylobacter because your dog is fed raw. And even though they might not be in direct contact with the actual, you know, the pet food itself, it's the dog that facilitates the transfer. And I'm not just making this up. This is actually studied. Um, and it's one of the reasons, say, you know, guide dogs are not allowed to be fed raw. And if we carry on, you wanting... <laughs> I don't know if you can see him. He's trying to make, he's trying to do high fives because <laughs> he thinks I'm lifting my arm up to give him a high five. He's too funny. Right. And on that note, we can talk about home cooked meals because it's kind of the same, like whether you're cooking or whether you've got that raw diet. Um, you know, a lot of people equate it all with, you know, food is love. We love our animals, so we're going to give them the best of the best. And um, and I guess that's when sometimes we've just got to remember that not – we've really got to remember about those nutrients and the risks. Um, for example, I've seen, uh, you know, fractures in dogs, like because they've been fed – just a, a diet based on liver, like a lot of liver in their diet. So they've got become um, very nutrient deficient. Well, actually not deficient, over um, supplemented by some nutrients and they get fractures of the bone. Um, I've also, you know, we've all heard of the things like rickets and that, that you know, that's caused by, um, nutrient issues, you know, deficiencies. So the same thing occurs with um, diets, especially home cooked diets. So any diet that's not commercial. Um, not saying that all commercial diets are good, though. Um, so also we do need to be wary about that. And of course, you know, we we had the whole problem with grain free, which popped up when that became a bit of a rage. So we know as well that. There's a study that actually looked at over 200 diets, home-cooked diets that were on the internet, and over 95% of those diets did not reach nutrient requirements. So some of them had too high, some of them were too low. Bottom line, none of them were acceptable for long-term feeding. So... The, uh, and a big problem with that is that a lot of people, like you get, you know, no one's saying that a home-cooked diet is bad either. So a lot of the times we might have a particular animal and we need to, as vets, like they might have a have a problem, say they've got kidney problems, um, maybe like often we might have a dog with kidney problems who also is prone to pancreatitis. So not only do we have to get our you know, calciums and our phosphorus really lined up. We have to, have to make sure it's really low in fats. And with this, you know, the balance can be really hard to get. So in the end, what we end up doing is we actually recommend a home cooked diet and we formulate that. We often add extra supplements to it. So we might be doing, um, we might have um, use a company called Balance It, which provides some vitamins and minerals. So we add those extras in. But remember, we're doing that under veterinary guidance. Those dogs are well um, monitored. We, we continue monitoring over time because one of the things that we also see a lot of is recipe drift. And what that is, is we give you the diet and next thing we know, oh, I can't get any I can't get any um, olive oil, so I'm going to replace that with some corn oil. Well, remember to, back to our slide um, earlier, 
can find that. And I know it's not talking about an oil, but it just goes to show that not every single ingredient has the same nutrients. So when we start shifting and changing and swapping things around, sometimes what we get is what we call you know recipe drift or nutrient drift and so we're not actually feeding our animals what we think we're feeding them and so you've got to be really really careful with that and if you find that you can't source a particular um, ingredient because for some reason maybe it's just there's a shortage and you need to change well then you need to contact the nutritionist or the vet nutritionist that made that diet for you and talk to them about what you can replace it with um, or that ingredient with. The other thing is we always recommend that if any animal is on a home cooked diet or a raw diet that they're actually checked over by a veterinarian every six months or so just to make sure that they're keeping along on a steady um you know, a steady uh, process and that they're not becoming ill in any way. Um, more so for those animals, I guess, who are on um, a diet that hasn't been nutritionally assessed by a expert. Um, that's probably the biggest need for that sort of thing. And of course, any of those animals that actually have an illness and that's put on a specific diet, but of course you'd probably be doing a lot more um, looking at them. Um, are you okay? What are you doing? <laughs> um, he's trying to get comfortable on me. He's like, oh, I want to sit there, but I'm not very comfortable. Yeah. Right, let's have a quick little chat then about diet supplements because we'll see that a lot of people do that now um again <laughs> there's no approval process for supplements so we don't even know if what we're getting is what we say they're getting and that's really annoying you know like it's yeah it's a it's a big problem we just don't know what we're getting half the time so all i can say is try and use a reputable company um, so for the dietary supplements, Balance It is a really good company for that sort of thing. Um, and of course, if there's a pharmaceutical company that's putting out a product and it's got uh, some sort of FDA approval or in Australia, APVMA, you know, the special label requirements um, and they're making some claims, that generally, generally means that it's gone through some testing and it might be okay and doing exactly what it says it's supposed to be doing, which is much better than just buying something that doesn't have those. Now, um, yeah, so it makes it very, very hard to know that, to believe labels and yeah, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a legal nightmare, to be honest. It's something that needs to change. We really, really need this as for our animals. So um, I know a lot of companies are totally against it. And I think that's because they know that their products will fail. Um, yeah. Yes, it's going to cost a bit of money to do bits and pieces. But, you know, there's nothing worse as a veterinarian seeing someone trying to do the right thing by the animals and actually ending up having um, a really bad situation and um, where their animal has actually become sick because of the, the good thing they were trying to do. Uh, what else can we say about diet supplements? So one of the things I see a lot of people doing is wanting to feed calcium, supplement calcium. So if never never ever supplement calcium especially to your breeding bitches or your puppies or your kittens or anything like that unless you've had veterinary guidance and because whilst that might have been okay back in the day when you know the foods were pretty bad and you know and there was none of this good formulations or anything the vast number of formulations for kibbles and you know, our commercial diets these days are very fine tuned. So if you supplement extra, you 
actually potentially put your animal at risk of being in excess or causing some pretty nasty problems to happen. So calcium is a pretty big one for that. We can see some pretty horrible things happen if we supplement that um, in a bad way. So please, if, if you have a breeder that says you must give calcium supplement to your puppy and your puppy's on a good diet, just, just nod and go, okay, okay, and just ignore them. <laughs> or talk to your vet about it because nine out, times out of 10, there's really no need to do that. Okay, and let's just have a little chat about pet food safety. In the US, it's, you know, under the category of the FDA and all the states have their own sort of um, state feed control guidelines. In Australia and New Zealand, there is nothing. Um, we, in Australia, we've got Pet Fast, which is a combination of um, the Pet Food Industry Association and the AVA, which is the Australian Vet Association. And whilst they record everything that they get told about, they have n absolutely no grunt, they have no legal backup to pursue anyone if they decide they're not going to, if their product's bad and they just want to keep selling it and they just want to keep doing things it's yeah so it's it's not yeah unfortunately it's not a great system so yeah there, there is no good pet food safety guidelines or anything um in australia and new zealand um us is slightly better all we can say is if you suspect that a pet food has been the cause of something always just tell your vet because they can contact um, either the FDA or PetFast, and they can get the ball rolling. They can help you contact the companies and that sort of thing because there's nothing worse than finding out there's something going on and and no one hears about it and it becomes a bit of a disaster. All right. So... Got the wrong button there. Sorry. Yeah. So I guess the bottom line is when you're trying to work out what to feed your pet, your best source of advice is actually your um, is actually your veterinarian. And one of the biggest questions we always get are, oh, you know, vets are in the pocket of big nutrition. And I actually have to laugh and laugh and laugh at that because I so wish I was. I'd make heaps of money. But no, we aren't. I'm sorry. So I'll just quickly explain how what happens with training for nutrition for vets. At vet school, um, you're trained by heaps of people, like professors that have spent years and years of time working on and specialising on a particular subject and they often are employed in the vet school because there's lots of cases for them to work on and do whatever. Now, when it comes to nutrition, the vet school is not the place to be. You don't really, if, you, if you're interested in nutrition, you generally go and work for a nutrition company. So, because there isn't really enough work in either private practice, um, unless you're a nutritionist related to um cattle there's lots of work for you know cattle nutritionists but there's not really the the work for um cat and dog nutritionists in private practice horse nutritionists even then it's not there's there's not the work for a horse nutritionist in that so generally speaking if you do horses and you if you love nutrition as a veterinarian you would go and work for a um, a company that um, that makes food products. With that said, when you're a student and they want to teach you about nutrition, they want to get you to have you taught by the best. So they call up the company and go, "Hey, is Doctor So and So available to come and give our students some training?" And this, and they so they come in and they give us our lectures on um, pet nutrition. Now. Remember, those 
lectures encompass everything and they are not just one lecture. I know some vets even say that and I have to wonder, were they asleep in that those semesters? Because we used to have nutrition lectures that lasted a year. So I, I don't know what they were doing. Maybe they were just one of those students that slept in their lectures. Anyway, so a lot of people think that just because the professor that comes and talks to us or the nutrition PhD person who works at a particular company comes and talks to us, that they we are in the pocket of Big Pharma. Nothing could be further from the truth. We don't actually get taught anything related to a specific diet um, or brand of diet. We're taught formulation, we're taught nutrients, we're taught how nutrients affect physiology and metabolism, and we're taught um, how we might formulate a diet. You don't need a company, a particular company, to do any of those things. It doesn't even come into it. So all those people out there that say that we're in the pocket of big nutrition, I really do have to laugh. And then you've also got to remember that if even if we are going to learn about a particular diet later, and maybe it's the diet that they are promoting, every single company does that. You know, they have sales reps for everything, whether it's a, you know, yeah. Anyway, the argument is pretty, pretty frustrating and null and void as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, don't ever think that your vet is getting handouts or anything we uh, the vast majority of vets sell very little pet food now anyway because it's not um we're just not able to um generate enough money from it you can get it cheaper from pet stores so there's no no point so we we don't do that but when a vet does recommend a particular diet it's usually because they have very good reason to do that um they've either experienced um a lot of animals do poorly on others or they um or they just end up um not um or the animal actually needs a prescription diet which is a particular um company might make righty ho let's have a look at some of these uh, questions let me see what's this question here donna do dogs' digestive systems work differently on raw or cooked? Is their digestion set up to tolerate one better than the other? Um, could you stop that noise? <laughs> He's just having a good scratch. Um, hopefully you, it's not too disconcerting. Um, no, with I, I guess the thing is, it's not their digest their digestive system is going to work whether it's raw cooked or kibble or anything like that so if you if you hear people say that um it's it's the digestive system is set up differently come on. um then i think they're talking a bit of a cod cos wallop to be honest we do know that when a diet is uh, cooked that some of the nutrients of course are actually um, are actually not um, we don't have the same level of nutrients that we start with in the uncooked so it's that's where we we need it's having a little cuddle here <laughs> in my lap um, so we do know that that yeah the levels of nutrients might change with a cooked diet so it's not necessarily that um, it's their digestion working differently. It's just that um, the nutrient levels will change. Um, and are they set up to tolerate one better than the other? Not at all. Honestly, dogs, whether it's kibble, cooked, uncooked, not a problem. I know a lot of people say, oh, you know, you've got to ease dogs onto a diet um, if they've um, if you're changing a diet, I have to admit, I don't even really do that to, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a hard and fast person that says, oh, okay, I'm going to, cause I just think the dog, you know, most dogs, I've never seen a dog or a cat do badly. If, if we change a diet from one day to the next, I mean, you know, you, you think about it, your, your dog's ill and so many people say, oh, put them on cooked chicken and rice. Did we ease them onto that? 
No. So why should we bother otherwise? So I'm not a big one with easing onto it into different diets either. So yeah, the whole digestion tolerating one over the other, absolutely not. Um, if we were to measure the level of acidity, you know, this is getting scientific now. If we were to look at the acidity of a st um, the acids in the stomach of a dog fed a kibble versus a dog um, that's fed, um, you know, a, a kibble versus a raw versus, you know, a cooked diet, and it's consistently fed that, then you're going to notice differences. And we know that. And we know that the bugs in the in the gut are all very different depending on the type of food you eat. And it's the same with us. You know, we we are what we eat, you know. Um, so it's, it's not um, unusual to find that. But as far as do they work differently? No, they all work exactly the same. Let me see. Susie, my cat got so sick on ivory coat. Oh, that's a shame. And I guess that goes, we have to say that it's very common to hear those sorts of things. So a lot of animals might not like and enjoy a particular diet. Does that mean that diet's a bad diet? Not necessarily. It just is no good for your that particular animal and so we've got to remember over the scheme of things um you know just because your friend's animal did well or your animal did badly or whatever it doesn't mean a diet is particularly good or bad now if we're saying to hear a theme like we have done with the grain free issue then yes we should be taking more note about what's going on um Oh, Loretta, that's not good. Um, can I just know thriving? Also have a team of the doing. Oh, yes, bloat. Yeah, with the Dobermans. So a team old Doberman. Now, one of the things that we recommend for animal, you know, the large breeds, especially Dobermen who've got a deep chest, so German Shepherds, Great Danes, Dobermans, Weimaranas, um, any of the pointer dogs, they're all quite prone to bloat and we really don't know what causes it. There's a lot of conjecture out there that everyone always says, oh, you know, it's kibble, it's this, it's that. But I can tell you now, I've done so many GDVs on warfare dogs with bloat that I cannot say that it's a kibble issue. Um, and again, that's just me personally. Um, but don't, I again, I just don't think you need to um, way into all that now as far as prevention of that um, it's a really good idea to slow down their eating so using feeders slow feeders so that they don't gulp it all down in two seconds flat um, you might spread their food over a few um, different meals over the day so instead of just feeding one meal a day which is quite large you might break that into three or four meals to spread it over a day and the other best thing that you can actually do for these dogs is actually to do um, a pexy surgery. And I can put a link into this below. Um, I actually did a tutorial on this quite a few years ago now, actually. Um, but it's on the YouTube channel. So I'll pop that um, in there. But basically, um, so you can have a listen. But the, the pexy is where we attach the stomach wall to the to the side of the body wall so we attach it to the wall so that it it can't flip and it doesn't stop bloat so the dog can still blow up the stomach but it will stop it flipping and it's the flipping that's actually the worst so um and that's what requires surgery so a lot of the times if they just bloat we can put we can put something down there um, you know, a tube down the esophagus, release the air from that, monitor them, keep doing that if we have to, which is a lot better than having to do surgery because as soon as they flip, we actually can't unflip them without doing surgery. And that's when you start to, um, 
yeah, really struggle because you you block off all the blood vessels, your tissue dies, and if you don't do it, it's it's a decision. The decision is euthanasia or surgery. There's no in between once they've flipped. So the PEXI surgery is the is the number one thing that we recommend to help prevent that, and that's what a lot of vets will be recommending. And so if you're um, if you've got a the best time to do it is generally when you go to neuter and spay and we just do that then uh let me see belly pinning yeah so that's what it is yeah so belly pinning is the surgery the pixie surgery so just ask your vet your vet probably already spoken to you about it because it's something that we would do as i said at spay and neuter time so once she's ready, once she's grown up a little bit and you're going to do that, that's when you do that. And even if you aren't going to do a spay or a neuter and you decide to against that, definitely would recommend that. Okay, looks like all the questions have been asked. But yeah, I hope that was helpful. The best person to talk to if you've got questions about your animal's diet is a veterinarian. Um we can help you decide on appropriate um, brands of food that incorporate all those things that you need for your for your yourselves. Um, we can do that with a consult through our service. Our vets can definitely help you with that. And um, yeah, it's it's definitely um, not it's not something to be afraid of. And I think we've got to remember. That Every time you hear somebody plugging something, whether it's marketing on Facebook, whether it's videos by some of these um, some of these people that are very much against, you know, the whole sh anti sugar brigade, we've really got to start to question their motives and are they actually promoting something as well? So, just um, not all. I don't mind if you want to feed a raw diet. That's fine. We've just got to make sure it's balanced, it's complete, um, and it's appropriate for your animal. Um, so it's not about it's not about this or that. It's about what's making it best for your animal. All right, then, guys. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Mr. Mordecai here. Might we might take him for a walk, maybe. He's been a good boy. <laughs> Go and get a coffee, our lunchtime coffee. All right then, guys, you have a good one. We'll talk to you.